We are in the chapter on why we believe in the afterlife, and we considered the fact that there's a tremendous um, belief in life after death. One CBS poll indicated that I think 75% of people or 80% of people believed that there was life after death, and of those people, 80% or so felt that they would have eternal life, that they would go to heaven. So, <laughs> Oliphant has a little bit of trouble with that, those numbers, but uh, hopefully that's the case. Anyway, um, we considered uh, the evidence uh, for life after death from a scientific point of view, a philosophical point of view, uh, and even a, a generally Christian point of view as we looked at uh, uh, Mr. Butler and his views where he tried to argue that uh, our consciousness, our personality continues in our body despite the changes in our body over time. We sleep and yet when we wake up we're still the same person. We might fall into a coma or uh, be put uh, un under a uh, anesthesia for a procedure in the hospital and yet wake up and we're still the same person. Uh, so despite what's happening to the body, the mind continues with us. Uh, and so his argument was that though we don't know this precise relationship between the mind, the soul, and the body, nonetheless, um, if the soul continues through the various stages of life in the body, then it's quite possible that without the body, the soul will continue. And Oliphant's point with that was, and maybe I can get this up for you here. Get this window up. Um, Oliphant's point was that uh, th this argument has no teeth, as he says, um, if we don't know what the soul is, uh, exactly how the soul is related to the body, then we can't really say with assurance that the soul will continue after the body has uh, passed on. So uh, that argument from the basis of what we don't know to what we don't know <laughs> is not very compelling. So we dismissed Butler as not having an adequate explanation for life after death. So now we're going to consider more directly the evidence from a Christian point of view as to why we believe that there is life after death. And he's going to take a bit of a detour at the beginning here and talk about the Humanist Manifesto. And we can discuss that for a moment and then get more into uh, a Christian view of life after death. So let's pray for a moment before we, we begin and ask for God's blessing on our time together. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the study that Dr. Oliphant has put together for us and for the way that he has uh, organized our thinking with regard to the great truths of the Christian faith. We do pray that your spirit would bless these times together. We pray that you would take these truths and impress them upon our hearts. We pray that you would strengthen our faith to believe in your word and to trust in your promises. And we pray, Lord, that through this, that you would keep our souls united to Christ, that you would preserve us from the lies and falsehoods that come to us from the world around us, and even the kinds of doubts and questions that come within our own hearts and minds. Help us to be grounded in truth, to be grounded in your word, and to trust in you. We pray for your blessing on our fellowship as well and our meditation. We ask it through Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> so we'll get started here. And uh, this is a, a fairly uh, extensive portion. I don't know that we'll be able to complete it this morning. Maybe we'll, we will, but um, we'll give it a shot, see how far we get. So he begins writing, The reason that most people believe in life after death may be its prominence in Western philosophical discussions. You recall that he talked to us about the Greeks and Greek philosophy and how Plato and others had an idea for the human soul 
and perhaps some idea of an afterlife, but with Plato he also believed that the soul was immortal, so it existed prior to being placed in our body, and then after the body's demise the soul continues, so that was kind of the Greek tradition of philosophy and their understanding of uh, life after death. It's an utterly groundless uh, wish, uh, but uh, that was the governing idea. Or maybe a side effect of a certain prominence of Christianity in Western history. So, uh, Christian faith has had a major impact upon Europe and North America, and then beyond that, Southern Europe, South America, as uh, Roman Catholicism also made its impact, and uh, Orthodoxy to the East. So, all of these streams of the Christian faith hold to life after death, of course. And if they uh, uh, provide for a cultural acceptance of that uh, in, in the general culture. Since most people believe in life after death, excuse me, in an afterlife, it might be a good idea to begin with that belief when speaking with people who are skeptical of Christianity. <clears throat> so I often suggest that you know if you're sitting with somebody at the uh, at the counter, perhaps at a diner, or you you are uh, walk, walking alongside somebody for a bit, uh, getting uh, some fresh air. One area of conversation might be a, a discussion of the afterlife. Do you believe that there is life after death? See what your friend thinks about that. And then use the benefit of the things that you've learned here or will be learning here to talk to them about uh, uh, why they believe in life after death, whether they have a sure foundation for that kind of thinking, and then how they can have a sure foundation in what Christianity offers. Um, so uh, it's a good starting point for a conversation about our relationship with God and uh, how we can be reconciled to Him. So Oliphant continues, I remember reading years ago the Humanist Manifesto 2 which was written by the agnostics Paul Kurtz and Edwin Wilson. It was a manifesto that was meant to proclaim the beliefs of humanism. The manifesto declared that promises of immortal salvation or fear of eternal damnation are both illusory and harmful. Instead, it said, Quote, science affirms that the human species is an emergence from national, excuse me, natural evolutionary forces. It also affirms that, quote, there is no credible evidence that life survives the death of the body. So there were two humanist manifestos. There was one earlier than this, of course, and that one, uh, I believe had authors like William James and um, also um, John Dewey and a few others involved in that. Um, perhaps uh, uh, Aldous Huxley. Uh, and so it, it's a, a affirmation of the religious idea of humanism. In other words, that man is the uh, supreme being in world history and time. There is no God beyond us and that we can find the answer to everything that we need in ourselves. We follow science as they understand it, the evolutionary uh, approach to science and the second humanist manifesto, I'm not sure why they uh, wrote a second one other than perhaps to perfect and safeguard it from some of the perhaps mistakes or overstatements of the first one. Um, but uh, we have uh, the second one before us this morning to consider. Uh, you'll see that they make the claim that the promises of salvation or eternal damnation are illusory and harmful. Clearly they have Christian faith in mind here. Um, so they are describing Christianity as an enemy to humanism, which of course it really is. We have a different point of view. And furthermore, um, it suggests that, or says, claims that Christian faith essentially is illusory and harmful. 
uh, bear that in mind when you think about our modern age today and the woke culture and the way in which Marxism is making its impact on our culture today. Uh, Marxism is just another version of humanism. Uh, man is the center of the universe. Uh, so that's their point of view. Now if promises of immortal salvation or eternal damnation were in fact illusory, then we would agree with the humanists that that is a harmful thing. We don't need to be misguided about the future life. Uh, we don't need to be scared into something or uh, flattered into doing something uh, that's not really there. But of course, uh, what I would say from a Christian point of view is that it is humanism itself that is illusory and harmful, uh, that it, it uh, is entirely inadequate to explain the world around us uh, and uh, certainly inadequate to explain anything like life after death. And I think the humanist has to really puzzle over the fact that uh, some 80-85% of people believe in life after death. Uh, that goes entirely against what humanism holds. So if humanism is really true and it's the natural way that people ought to believe, since that's the, the outgrowth of who we are, how do you account for this life after death, this idea of life after death being so popular? You could perhaps reverse things, reverse the numbers and say, okay, there could be a few crackpots out there that believe that there's some something after this world. But most people would have an idea that this life is all there is because we are simply the result of random uh, interactions of atoms and chemicals and molecules and these kinds of things and all, all of a sudden here we are and surely we know this is all there is and when we die that's it. So in any case uh, we're introduced to the Humanist Manifesto and Oliphant will take the analysis further. He writes, for the humanist, the notion of life after death is an illusion. Human beings emerged from natural forces. Once human life ends in death, there's nothing beyond. Both the origin and the destiny, the beginning and the end of a human being, point to nothing but darkness and the void. We started by a chance collection of forces in nature, there was no purpose for our existence except that it just happened. Human beings are a cosmic collection of random events. Once this human accident is dead, since it came from nothing, absolutely nothing remains. Now isn't that a very comforting philosophy? Now they would say, well, we're being realistic. That's just the way it is. Uh, I would suggest that uh, they are dead wrong. Um, the uh, statements here are rather bleak uh, in that there, there's nothing that leads up to your present existence. There's no nothing behind you uh, that uh, means that you're going to have any existence. There's not a God, in other words, who determines your life, who uh, sets forces at work such that you are born, conceived, and grow as a child, and so forth. There's nothing like that to govern your, your life, and so your presence at this moment is a mere accident of history. That's all it is. And your death will be equally an accident of history. Uh, if you can even t speak of history, um, because isn't that just a collection of random events as well? And what rhyme or reason do random events have? Uh, but in any case, uh, you see that if there's nothing, no reason for your present existence, and once your present existence ends, there's nothing after that, then what is the significance of your life? Uh, humanism has no way of ascribing significance to you or meaning. Uh, there's nothing that says that your actions that take place today have uh, meaning or significance for your future. In other words, there's no life after death, so there's no reward for a good life, no punishment for an evil life. Um, there's no relationship with God uh, to hold you accountable or 
uh, to enjoy him. And so your life has no meaning or significance other than the feelings that you might have about yourself in the moment. But even that is just a random accident. So uh, not a very comforting idea. In reading through this manifesto, however, this one line jumped off the page. Remember, Oliphant's talking about a time when he got to read this for himself. And he writes, quote, from the manifesto, the preciousness and dignity of the individual person is a central humanist value. Anyone who is alert to what this manifesto is trying to say will be confused by this last affirmation. How is our life precious if it is merely accidental? The fact is that there can be no real dignity to a human being if it is only a chance produced collection of temporal dying materials, a person would have no more preciousness and dignity than a garbage heap. A garbage heap is a collection of material things that eventually decomposes and ceases to exist. How is a human being different from this, according to the humanist? How can you associate preciousness and dignity with a garbage heap? So, uh, the humanist really needs to answer for their uh, faith commitment, is really all that it is, that there is a, a person there, and that there's a dignity and a preciousness to the person involved. How do you even come up with an idea of personhood from a humanist perspective if all we are is the uh, result of a random uh, interaction of atoms and molecules and that sort of thing? I mean, how do you arise to the idea of personhood, which is an immaterial idea? So, it seems to me the humanist has a hard time describing people as persons. And then what is more, how can they then also um, ascribe preciousness and value to that person if it's merely the result of an accident, random chance events? And so, uh, this whole idea seems to me, and to Oliphant as well, to be a, an exercise in uh, exaggeration, uh, fantasy, uh, hope, uh, groundless hope, but not in, um, not in science, not in uh, materialism. Uh, so, uh, Oliphant makes the comparison between humans and a garbage heap. Uh, not a very flattering image. Uh, so we'll uh, just move along from there. The fact is, if you're going to be intellectually honest, you can't. Uh, that is, you, you can't describe a difference between a human and a garbage heap or ascribe dignity to the person. Preciousness and dignity are terms that point beyond the material, and the accidental. They require that there be something that is honorable and worthy of esteem. Material that eventually decomposes cannot produce dignity. There is only one way to ascribe dignity to human persons. They have to be more than their simple physical existence. So, you know, this is why it's so important uh, when we talk about Marxism in our modern age, which is really humanism, uh, maybe humanism on steroids, but uh, Marxism likewise sees uh, this life as all there is, uh, sees uh, that we are a random collection of events, that we're in the maelstrom of uh, history, which is moving towards a classless society, and uh, your life is really no more significant than the, the uh, purpose that it holds in advancing this classless society. Um, so really in a Marxist point of view, there, there's no human dignity. That's why in Marxist societies like uh, the Soviet Union and China, you have a, a, a great disregard for the sanctity of human life. Uh, uh, this Marxism is responsible for the slaughter of millions of people through uh, the Russian gulags and uh, Chinese slave camps and uh, Chinese people um, uh, 
using uh, prisoners for organ transplants. Uh, I mean, this is the kind of thing that Marxism uh, is known for. And our, our young people today who are enamored with socialism and Marxism really don't appreciate what they're uh, supporting. This is a philosophy of death. And uh, so um, th there's just no place for a sense of human dignity or preciousness within a Marxist humanist worldview. Uh, only Christianity can provide for dignity and preciousness because as Oliphant will make the point in a moment, uh, we are made in the image of God. And that sets us apart from this world. We have a human soul that is immortal, that will go beyond this life. And so there is something very precious about human existence. So we'll continue here. When we consider the reasons why Christians believe in a future life, we begin at the beginning. When we read about God's activity of creation in Genesis 1 and 2, we see that the climax of creation was the creation of man and woman in the image of God. For five days, God is simply saying, let there be, and there was. But on the last day, God takes counsel with himself. In so doing, excuse me, in doing so, he is marking the fact that what he is about to create is substantially different from what he has been creating. That difference, as we see in Genesis, is not in the material that God used to create man. So you recall in Genesis 1, as God is about to create Adam and Eve, he holds this counsel with himself. He says, let us make man in our own image. There is this deliberation on God's part with regard to man that you did not see in the creation of the animal world, of, of the, the bird kingdom, or the fish in the sea. There's no sense of deliberation about them. It's just let there be fish in the sea and birds of the sky and so forth. But with humans, he says, let us make man in our own image. And so there is this um, self-reflection, this uh, contemplation on the part of God as to the uniqueness of the human being that would be created. And we continue, like the animals, Adam was formed from the dust of the ground. He was made from the same stuff as the animals. The difference for Adam and from him Eve, and it is remarkable, and it is a remarkable and profound difference, is that once God formed Adam from the dust of the ground, he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Genesis 2 verse 7. We also learned that because it was not good for Adam to be alone, God formed Eve from Adam so that both of them were, in their creation, made as the image of God. So Eve shares in the image of God fully just as Adam does. She was made from Adam. And uh, we see here the, the uniqueness of God's creation of Adam, the the personal connection that God has with his first creatures. He breathes into his nostrils the breath of life. It's as though God reaches down, you know, in CPR, you breathe into that individual to bring them back to life again. It's as though God comes down to this human figure on the ground and breathes into him, bringing life and breath into him. I was reading a book review in our New Horizons magazine of a recent publication by uh, one of our uh, presbyters here in the Presbytery of Philadelphia uh, and also one who uh, had taught at Westminster Seminary, Lane Tipton. He's written a book on the Covenantal Foundations for Theology, I think was the title of the book. But he has this one statement in the, the book which is quoted by the reviewer, Danny Ollinger, where he, he says that God breathed into, his, into Adam's nostrils so that with that breath, Adam, in response, could return and praise God for that which he's made. So there is this, this kind of um, mutuality here in the creation effort. God breathes into Adam and Eve, and then because of that breath, Adam is then able to voice the praises of God and extol him for all that he has done. 
with the very breath that God gave to him. So, um, kind of a, a pretty neat image from uh, Lane Tipton. So, here is the uniqueness of God's work with Adam and Eve. He did not do this with the animals. Uh, man shares uh, a good deal with the animal kingdom in terms of the physical nature of our bodies, and that's kind of what science uh, uh, tries to work off of, the, the certain commonality between the structures of our bodies and those of animal life, and so they try to point to a progression from uh, an amphibious uh, uh, amoeba or whatever that comes up onto the ground and then evolves over time, becomes an ape and finally becomes erect and finally uh, takes on a human mind and personality. Um, and so they point to the continuity of uh, uh, material uh, re um, uh, stuff that, that enables us to, be, to live in this world. So there's certain measure of carbon, all different kinds of atoms and so forth within us, and there's uh, a skeletal structure, a brain, and all these kinds of things, digestive tract, and all these sorts of things. And so there's a commonality between us and the animal kingdom. And so the evolutionary scientist says, well, there you see, we're derived from that. Well, it's just the fact that we're made in this world for this world, and God was pleased to uh, give us that kind of connection with the animal kingdom. Uh, but we are definitely not animals. Um, so Christianity is unique in asserting that man is made in the image of God, and this makes him, him special, uh, sacred, and therefore uh, a life worthy of protecting. And uh, bear that in mind with regard to the abortion debate, and also euthanasia, uh, and as well... Uh, um, the kinds of things that take place in, in murders and uh, political uh, actions to uh, destroy one's enemies. Uh, we believe that uh, the human nature is sacred, made in God's image. So he continues, God created Adam in his image, and unlike the rest of creation, God breathed into Adam the breath of life. Humans bear the image of God and are given the breath of life, what nothing else in creation was given. Dr. Brooks Peters. With Adam and Eve, their life was an inbreathed life. Unlike the animals, the life of Adam and Eve includes a special relationship to God, including certain responsibilities, excuse me, certain responsibilities that God gave to them in the garden. They were to tend the garden under God. They were to be in charge of the day-to-day -day organization of the garden where God had placed them. They were to work under God as his servants and as lords over creation. This is what image of God meant. And they were to keep themselves away from one particular tree that God designated to be off-limits. So when God creates Adam and Eve and places them in the garden, their relationships are not only horizontal with the animal world. They have a vertical relationship with God himself, and indeed that's the primary relationship. They are to have communion with God, fellowship with God, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Um, they were obligated to serve this God by taking care of the garden and watching over the animal kingdom there before them. And so they had different responsibilities before this God. So clearly, uh, just as man is upright, he is one who looks up towards God, whereas the animal kingdom looks down below and is really occupied with life in this realm. Uh, man is unique and special, and God set us apart for himself. Oliphant continues, If Adam and Eve had kept God's commandment to stay away from the forbidden tree, they would have continued forever to live in the garden in perfect fellowship with God. There would have been no life after death. There would have been no death. The inbreathed life that they had at the beginning would have continued without end. They would have been fruitful and multiplied as they tended the garden under God 
and in fellowship with him. They didn't obey God. They violated his commands and rebelled against the living relationship that he had established with them. Uh, there's an important point here to bear in mind, uh, and that is that death is not natural. It's not the way things should be. Uh, the evolutionist, the humanist, thinks that death is just the way things are. It's the natural evolving of whatever it is that we are. We die. And so uh, death is a natural thing for uh, the humanist. And uh, as a consequence, they don't see death as a penalty for sin. They don't see death as a reflection on our alienation from God or as a sign that we need to be reconciled to God. Death is merely something that happens. Uh, it's no more... Dr. Brooks Peters. It's no more significant than um, uh, just a, a random uh, you know, a bird dropping out in, the, the, sky, out in the, the sky on my nice black Lincoln LS. Uh, Katya and I have a joke about my black car attracting... Uh, bird droppings. So anyway, I got to move the car. But um, there's, there's no real significance to uh, human life accordingly. So man is made in the image of God and that makes us unique and, and special. If Adam and Eve had kept God, okay, we read that. The rest of the Bible is a description of what God does because of Adam's sin. The first thing he does is curse them with death. The death that he had promised if they ate from the tree becomes a reality after sin. They are dust, and to dust they shall return. Genesis 3 verse 19. But the death that Adam brought to creation is not the whole story. God provides a way for fellowship with him to continue. We learn early on that the Lord accepts the offering of Abel, but not of Cain. From the, even from the beginning, there was a way, an offering, that God would graciously accept so that a living fellowship with him could continue. So here, God is providing for life after death, but not mere existence, but actually a restored relationship with him. And so the, these kinds of activities in history and time uh, point us to the reality that there is life after death and that there is a restoration of fellowship with God because of what God has done. As the rest of Scripture unfolds, we begin to see that there are those who walk with God and who therefore are living in fellowship with God even at the end of their lives here on earth. See Genesis 5 verse 24, for example. The clear teaching of Scripture is that the inbreathed life that God gave to Adam and Eve means that people will continue to exist beyond their earthly lives. That inbreathed image of God life is an existence that will never end. Jesus makes clear to the Sadducees that when God calls himself the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he is calling himself the God of those who are alive not of the dead. Um, I'll just remind you as we go on here of our earlier study on the authority of Scripture and how we believe that Scripture is the very Word of God. And so Scripture uh, speaks to uh, the important things of life, uh, such as life after death and our relationship with God. And we can trust what it has to say because it is God's Word. And so as we come to a discussion about life after death and reconciliation with God and all these kinds of things, uh, our foundation for these things is really in the authority of God's Word. We have something on which to rest, a, a true, sure foundation. And so we are seeing the benefit of that foundation uh, in then our ability to say that there is life after death, there is the possibility of reconciliation with God, through the sacrifice that God himself has provided, through Jesus Christ, his death on the cross, these things come to us through God's revelation, 
uh, given to us in his word. And so we're reminded once again of the importance of uh, a right view of scripture as the word of God. Any uh, doubt about that, any relegation of scripture to just merely another book in human history, uh, subject to the vicissitudes of history, is really uh, something that destroys, utterly destroys, really, any hope in life after death, in reconciliation with God, really in human personhood or uniqueness, preciousness, the whole thing, it all collapses once you abandon uh, faith in the uh, revealed Word of God. And so, um, as uh, Oliphant points out here, is as the rest of Scripture unfolds, we're following the, the direction that Scripture gives to us about these things. And we're seeing the, the firm foundation that they provide for us. And in our experience, we see that what Scripture testifies to is very, very true. Our experience matches with us. We are conscious of sin, conscious of alienation from God because of sin. We are conscious of the fact that we need reconciliation with God. And if we have come to faith in Jesus Christ, we know of the forgiveness of our sins. We know of what it means to be in fellowship with God. And these are things that go beyond science, beyond philosophy and these kinds of things. Uh, but they're a part of our experience and they match what Scripture, God's revelation, tells us about ourselves and our world around us. So th these two things interact with each other and one reinforces the other for us. And so uh, we come to this idea that Jesus himself says uh, when God calls himself the the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Jesus draws the deduction, a logical deduction from that claim that therefore Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are alive. In other words, he's positing that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, though dead, are uh, worshiping God. They are in the service of God because God is their God even now. Uh, he continues to be the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so he is the object of their worship even in the days of Jesus and to this day as well. So there is life after death. And Jesus uh, uses a little bit of reasoning from the sacred text of the Old Testament to demonstrate life after death. Some of us might wonder, does the Old Testament talk to us about life after death, about resurrection, these kinds of things? And Jesus makes it very plain that it does. So continuing, we also find out from Scripture that there is a stark division between those who die in Christ and are in fellowship with God and those who don't. Jesus spoke of a man who died and was with Abraham and another man who died but was in torment. That's found in Luke's Gospel, chapter 16. In both cases, because each man was made in God's image, Existence continues into eternity. For those who die in Christ, existence continues in Him and with God. For those who die in their sins, existence continues, but it consists of nothing but eternal torment. You have here an emphasis on the fact that with death there's not the annihilation of the soul. There's not a soul sleep either. Uh, after we pass from this life, there is a continuing existence of our souls into eternity. Uh, Lazarus is in the bosom of Abraham. The rich man who isn't named, uh, he's unimportant. He is uh, in, in Hades, in hell. And uh, so uh, both individuals pass from this life and continue on. There is life after death for both of them, the righteous and the wicked, but they go to separate places um, according to God's plan for them and according to their own lives. Oliphant says, It is clear from Scripture that, quote, image of God includes an inbreathed life, an inbreathed character that is distinct from everything else in creation. It is distinct centrally in that it implies a relationship with God for eternity that ends either excuse me, in eternal fellowship with him or in eternal torment 
under his wrath. The difference, as we have seen in a previous chapter, has to do with one's relationship to Christ. But in each and every case, human beings continue to exist beyond death. One either exists eternally with Christ under God's grace, or one exists eternally in torment under God's wrath. Once we begin to exist, the life principle that makes us image of God guarantees our eternal existence. So the image of God uh, is that which continues on into eternity, either in hell or in heaven, um, our soul being made in that image. The CBS poll to which we referred in the beginning says that three-fourths of the population believe in heaven and hell. So up to this point, much of what we have said is already affirmed by most adults. What is troubling about this poll is that 82% of these adults think they will spend eternity in heaven. This may betray a basic ignorance of the way of salvation which we have already addressed. If all 82% were asked why they believe they will be in heaven, answers would vary significantly. Without the information that we have from Scripture, it is impossible to have a true and solid explanation for such a belief. Um, actually, there are only two answers that people can give to that question. Why would God let you into heaven? And the one answer is, well, because I deserve it. Basically, I lived a good life. Now, you may describe it in different ways. Uh, you may say, I, I, uh, I, I went to church. I... Uh, took penance, I, I engaged in good works, and therefore you should receive me on the basis of these things. Or it might be that I, I gave my life as a martyr for Allah. I uh, lived as a good Muslim. I attended all my uh, Friday prayers and all these kinds of things. It's works righteousness eventually, no matter which uh, way that you approach it. The, the mainline Protestant, I lived a good life. I was uh, helping the poor and, and uh, serving in soup kitchens and these kinds of things. Well, all that might be good on the surface, but that will not save you. And so a faith in one's good works is uh, the one way in which people will uh, claim to have a right to heaven. The only other option is the work of Christ on our behalf. Will you claim your own works or Christ's works on your behalf? Um, your works are insufficient. They will lead to destruction. Christ's work is perfect righteousness. It is uh, divine righteousness, and therefore it fully satisfies God's law, and it is our only hope. And so that's what we rest in for everlasting life. Oh, oh, oh. Okay, so continuing on. There are two more points that we need to recognize as we think about why we believe in life after death. These two points will not be as widely believed or known as believe in life as belief in life after death. They do, however, give much more content to what Christians believe about life after the grave. The first point has to do with our original discussion about Greek philosophy and its idea of the immortality of the soul. On occasion, when the topic comes up, I will ask a group this question. What happens to the soul of a Christian when he dies? The question is, in one sense, a trick question, because it is designed to elicit a specific response. The typical answer that I get is, it goes to heaven. Then I ask, what is the it that goes to heaven? Sometimes the answer will be, the soul. But this is not an accurate picture of the Christian view of life after death. The picture that Scripture gives us is not that when we die, some thing of ours goes to heaven. This is the problem with the Greek view of the soul and its immortality. It may be the case that there, is, there, there has been too much Greek influence on Christian thinking when it comes to these topics. Let's just continue with Oliphant for a moment here. Instead, when we die, we go to be with Christ. 
in Paul's letter to the Philippians, he is telling the church as he writes from prison that it is possible that he will die. And he contrasts his life here with his life if he dies. He puts it this way, I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. The contrast here is between being in a far better place with Christ because of death or remaining in the body on earth. Paul does not say that if he dies, his soul will be with Christ. Rather, if he dies, he will be in a far better place with Christ, rather than remaining alive in the body on earth. Death brings us into a better place, but we should also see that death separates what was not initially meant to be rent asunder. We'll just keep following him for a little bit here. The biblical picture of our lives after death is not simply that a soul goes to heaven. Instead, we need to remember that our separation from our bodies when we die is an abnormal separation. It is a result of the entrance of sin in the world. If Adam and Eve had not sinned, there would have been no death. Thus, no separation of their existence from their bodily existence on earth. For the Christian, to be with Christ after death is to be absent from the body. But there will be a time, at the end of time, when we will receive resurrected bodies. Because we have a natural body, those who die in Christ will receive a spiritual body because Christ was raised from the dead. We will discuss this more in the next chapter. Thus, the time between our death and the end of time is commonly called the intermediate state. What that means is that even though we live with Christ after our death, we have not yet become what we will be for eternity. So Alphen is reminding us that we are made uh, originally as a whole, body and soul, and that they are meant to be together throughout uh, our existence. Sin has disrupted that relationship between the soul and the body. So when we die, there, we enter into a kind of abnormal situation. Our souls, our persons, we enter into the presence of Christ. But there's something of uh, a nakedness to that, uh, being in, in, in the presence of Christ without a physical body. So we await the time when our uh, resurrection body will be given to us at the end of history and time. So I think what Oliphant is trying to remind us of is, first of all, there is a, a continuity for us, spiritually, personally, from this life into the next. Um, I think I mentioned this some time ago. Uh, I was listening to Dr. D. James Kennedy preach one time from uh, John chapter 11 where Jesus tells, uh, I think it's Martha, that he who believes in him, though he die, yet shall he live. And he who lives and believes in me will never die. And then uh, Dr. Kennedy said, I will never die. And when he put it that starkly at first. He thought, what are you, nuts? Of course you're going to die. We all die. And in fact, Kennedy did die probably within a couple years of that sermon. In any case, his point was that our consciousness continues on through death into that next realm. Uh, now, we will be transformed. We will be set free from sin. Our mind, our souls will no longer be under the... the influence of sin, so there will be a tremendous freedom for our human soul as we enter into that next world, um, a great liberation, but there's also a sense that this is not quite normal for us, and there's yet something to come for us. We await eagerly uh, the resurrection of the body. Uh, yeah. Yeah, sorry for the interruption, Doc. Yeah, your dad wants to go home. Okay.
We're, we're coming. We're coming. We're pulling in now. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll look for you. Right. I'll, I'll find a spot. All right, thank you. Thanks. Sorry. Uh, oops. Oh, they're pulling up. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, let me read for just a little bit more. Typical pictures of life after death include things like people becoming angels, like Clarence and the movie It's a Wonderful Life. Pictures of people with wings playing harps on clouds are all too typical when it comes to depicting life after death. But the biblical picture is far different. Well, let me just add one thing that um, I think that Rich is trying to get to, but is that I, do, we, do we see here that what Scott Oliphant is trying to say is that we are not a soul just living in a body but we are body and soul, that a human being is both physical and spiritual, that you can't separate them and say, oh, uh, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a soul and I could live in a dog or I could live in a cat. Or I, I know, no, I'm, I'm a human being and I have to have a human body and they have to be together. It's interesting that we won't live after death. We won't live in the, in heaven okay. in just a spiritual or a soul existence. We'll have to have a body. There has to be a resurrection because human beings are both soul and, and body. Well, I guess we, we do have to live for a certain time separated, though, I guess, right? Right, but it, as Rich says, it's not natural. Right, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Not, not, not that it's uh, the intermediate state, which he mentioned here, is something that the Bible doesn't say much about it, and people, people sometimes, as I'm afraid we all do, <laughs> we we tend to make statements or imagine things. And we better be careful. Like there's a book called Heaven. I believe it's in Job. The Job says, yet without my flesh, I'll see God. So um, so the, the, soul has a, the soul has a life outside the body. But what is that life? <laughs> we can't describe it completely because the Bible doesn't give us a complete description of it. It, it, it does say that the rich man recognized Lazarus. Right. Yeah, so, Jesus tells that in the parable. You see? <laughs> but so I guess there is there's some way uh, that they would recognize or I don't know. Yeah, I think that <laughs> when we talk about recognizing Moses and David or Adam and Eve uh, and all are uh, recognizing our family members that have gone to heaven. I think that that's true, but, <laughs> but I don't know. I don't know how my grandfather and grandmother on my mom's side are going to welcome me in heaven. I don't know, <laughs> you know, what, what that will be like. You know, I don't expect hugs and kisses, but <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah, but but I do expect that I will have contact with them, and you know, in a in a spiritual way. I don't want to go much farther because I'm afraid I'm going to get off into never never land and not come back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there are a lot of mysteries yet. And uh, there are a lot of things that we can't explain. Um, and certainly, how do we identify each other? I don't know. But uh, we will be able to, so we'll have to wait and see. Um, you know, it's hard to believe that someone will be able to identify me in heaven because I won't be a bald headed guy with glasses. <laughs> you know, I'm not even going to have a body. <laughs> no. No. I won't have a voice as far as I know I, I mean I don't know but God does speak 
but then does not have a voice <laughs> in the same sense that we do. And our bodies um, can't say that. <laughs> I think this is the first time I understand where free will is involved here because God gave us a choice and he also gave us a remedy. The choice was to do Adam not to do what he did and we would just be where we were supposed to be. But being as we didn't, we had three steps. We had to be person. We had to get through it decently and then we go to God anyway so he gave us an option well we do have a, a, you know, a free will to a certain extent but our, our will is determined by our nature and if our nature is sinful then our our will will always make the wrong choice uh, it will choose for that which is sinful it's only by that's why we got the option yeah. that's why we got the option in the end where God Fixed it. Uh, no. You mean after we die? Yeah. Yeah. He, no. The, he took it, but we still got a chance. And yeah. We can. Still no, actually, uh, the Bible says there's. It's appointed to man once to die, and after this, the judgment. And so there's not a, an opportunity after death to then be presented with the gospel or with a choice at that point as to whether we want to, believe in Christ or. Suffer damnation. Um, that choice has to be made in this life, in the course of this life. And once we pass from this life, that, that's it. Um, that's why it's so important for us to bear witness to our neighbors and friends and, and send missionaries around the world so sure. that people can hear the gospel and come to faith in Christ now. Once one dies and passes from this life, their eternal destiny is very much set. Uh, they're, they're, um, they'll be going to... the um, their final abode. I don't know if Rick wants to jump in on that at all. but mm -hmm. I, I totally agree with you. I just didn't say it right. Okay, very good. <laughs> very good. Um, yeah, I, I think you know, today is the day of salvation is another way that Scripture talks about it. It's today that we have the opportunity. We shouldn't. And, and even in cir some circumstances we can say that um, there's a time in one's life when uh, you may draw near to God, but if you resist the Holy Spirit and resist the preaching of the gospel over an extended period of time, it may be that you might be still living in this world, but you may still never come to hear the gospel again or never, certainly never uh, come to God um, because you get hardened in your sin and you're well, given over to that. that. Um, so mm -hmm. today is the day of salvation. When you hear the gospel, this is the moment to respond to that and not to presume that somewhere down the road, you know, just before you're going to die, well, then you'll give your life over to Christ and that will be that. By that time, your heart is set. It's well set. And, so. I, I heard, heard a poll years ago that oh my, uh, a very high percentage of human beings that come to faith in God come to faith in him before they're 18 years of age. That, so that they were, the poll was showing that the older you get, as Rich says, the more hardened you get. And the Bible makes it very clear that we don't just harden ourselves. God hardens us. What's up? Uh, we have that experience when, with Pharaoh in the time of Moses because you're either... Uh, to sort of get us off the track, I'm afraid. You're either uh, an elect person or you're a reprobate person. So there are two, two kinds of persons in the world at all. And there are those that God has chosen before the foundation of the world and those who God has rejected before the foundation of the world. And to make evangelism sort of simple, we're looking for the elect, <laughs> we, we often say, uh, in Calvinistic circles. But um, God knows who, who is redeemed and who, who Christ died for, uh, and all we don't. But uh, that's why Peter writes in one of his epistles, make your calling and election sure, 
be certain that you know you've put your faith and trust in Christ um, because uh, the longer you put it off, the more danger you're in and the very possibility that the Holy Spirit will remove any influence from you to bring you to faith. I, I, I would say, too, to, to look for evidence. So the, the, maybe one evidence could be the fact that we're all here on a study. It'd be probably pretty good evidence that we're, that we're interested in the, in the right path mm. you know, and, and going in the right direction. And even, even those who are maybe agnostic but with an open mind, they, it still could be that they may be saved. It, it's a, it, there's, you know, there's still chances for someone like that if they're if they're open to to scripture and they think they're you know they, they might find themselves attracted to it. I guess it's the you could find that evidence over time. Well, we see we see that in the thief on the cross. Yeah, there, you know, there's a perfect example. Yeah, you know, we know that we we can't say never that. Even someone dying on a cross in a very cruel fashion, and all uh, God works salvation in them. Yeah, whereas a militant atheist, well, you could probably pretty much bet that they're they're going the other way. Uh, it was it's a pretty good evidence. Well, you know, the pretty good evidence. Well, we had, and we had the Apostle Paul. As a, I mean, well, look at him, right? How, how many? How many people living in Paul's time before he was converted said, would say, oh, don't worry, he'll come around five <laughs> years from now, ten years from now. <laughs> and most people would say, he's incorrigible. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's true. I don't want, in fact, remember how um, uh, Ananias, who lays his hands on Paul's eyes and heals him. Yeah. Remember how, how he responded when when the Lord told him to go and visit with Paul. <laughs> and, and all he says, wait a minute, this guy's a murderer. <laughs> you, <laughs> he kills Christians. Yeah. I'm a Christian. I don't want to go into his presence. <laughs> it's a suicide mission. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was a very bold thing for him to do. Yeah, trust that God would take care of him in that, and uh, but that's the effect of regeneration, the power of the Holy Spirit to change a yeah. person's heart and life and make them new. And you know, w what better testimony is there to um, conversion, salvation, uh, than the conversion of the Apostle Paul, who was going to Damascus to arrest Christians and had that and that alone on his mind. And yet is interrupted sovereignly by this by Christ Himself, uh, uh, brought to repentance, brought to repentance, and, and you know his life goes in a completely different direction after that. Um, there's no way to account for that other than the intervention of God in his heart and his life and the changing of his heart. And uh, he's a great example of what God needs to do for all of us to change us from our sin, even though it might not be developed in the same way that Paul's was, Saul, uh, but we still need to have our sinful life interrupted, stopped, broken, and we need to be set off on a different direction, and that's what uh, happens to us in Christ. So, just a wonderful picture of God's sovereignty and salvation and the great change that occurs. Paul probably is not Paul is an example of God doing it, as Rich says, but I would say that most Christians wouldn't, wouldn't have the testimony of Paul. No. Um, <laughs> first of all, they didn't have a vision. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, and more like Paul had. It's by the persuasion of the Spirit, using the Word of God, or using a testimony, yeah. or a sermon, yep. or a book you read, or a tract you read, something like that. But Paul, I mean, that's um, just a remarkable work of God in a man. A divine, divine intervention yeah. in a remarkable way. Then we have Timothy, 
who from the earliest of days had known the scriptures and had a grandmother and a mother who taught him yeah. the, uh, the gospel. So Timothy would not be aware of a dramatic moment in his life where there was a change in his life. He always right. grew up knowing the Lord and seeking to serve him. So, I mean, that's certainly a, a very ordinary way in which people come to a relationship with Christ. It's part of their natural uh, life as they're raised within a Christian family and household. Um, but there are others that do have a, a moment when God dynamically, dramatically changes their hearts and lives. I think that Paul would probably say, if someone asked him about um, his conversion account as compared to Timothy's, he would say, I'm the chief of sinners. I, you know, I didn't deserve God to intervene in my life the way he did. But if I would have chosen, I would have rather grown up like Timothy. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yep. I think that uh, we'll... we'll finish up our study here, although we're only a couple pages away from the end, at least in terms of the computer here. Um, but I think there's enough material here that we should spend a little bit of time reviewing uh, what Oliphant said, trying to understand it a little bit more, and then uh, make our way through the end of the chapter for our next time. So um, this will be one of those cliffhangers where <laughs> you have to wait till the next episode to find out what happens next. <laughs> um, I think the last sentence you read, Rich, was, um, or one one of the last sentences you read, was the uh, sentence. Um, what that means is that even though we live with Christ after our death, we have not yet become what we will be for eternity. So, he's just mentioned the intermediate state. Uh, a paragraph before that, or in that paragraph. So, um, you know, we, even though I, those who are believers and have died and have, uh, are in heaven with the Lord, um, we're, they are not 100% <laughs> uh, what, what they should be as a human being. They... Yes, they're redeemed and uh, in a way in which they know more than we do in some ways. But they have not been, as I was saying before, they're not the whole person, the whole human that they're supposed to be. They don't have a body. So there's more to come for them. They're waiting for the redemption of their bodies. You know. Yeah, that's a pretty amazing thing to think about. Um, even when we pass from this life and enter into the presence of God, our salvation is not yet complete. <laughs> There's more yet to come. And uh, it awaits the final resurrection, a new heavens and new earth. Uh, Oliphant's going to say in a moment that heaven's really not our home for eternity. It's a renewed right. earth. So it's very much a corporal existence that we'll have in the world to come. It, it, it might. It seems that possible now. Maybe I'm going out there right now. But once they enter, the, the soul enters to be with Christ and waiting for the body. They 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 would be almost, I, I guess, in, in eternity at that point, where time would be irrelevant. I mean, they, they probably wouldn't know if they were waiting a minute or a thousand years. Um, there would. Be, I'm I'm just guessing, but I I, I have nothing to prove. I think with. I think you're right on. Yeah, it would seem that that is there's no time. It's a time. I can't comprehend that really, but I mean I, I got an inkling that it seems like you're now you're in you're just with Christ where we all need to be. <laughs> you know, people people speculate all the time what what heaven's like, and they saw, oh my mother's looking down on me from heaven, you know, or I. I talk to my mother all the time in heaven. I make myself, what? Where did you get that notice? I mean, that's almost, that's about as bad as praying to Mary. 
Uh, you know, and, and I'm thinking, like, I hope my grandfather's not watching down on me the way I'm dealing with my garden. I could make so many mistakes down here. <laughs> <laughs> I think yeah, about and they that, know it too. <laughs> on those beautiful, peaceful days in the garden when you're, you know, taking care of the plants and the sunshine, and especially when I'm looking out at freezing snow right now. But but still, you know, I'm like boy, I'm, I really hope he's not looking down. <laughs> yeah, true. That's true. Just I'm just kidding around, but you know, it's, it's kind of funny the things people say. And, yeah, you know, I think I think saints in heaven have a lot better things to do than to. Be looking to see what Rick Shaw's doing. <laughs> yeah, 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 I know. It's, it's, it's humiliating to find out that I'm really not that important. <laughs> uh. Uh, think of the image in uh, the book of Revelation of the uh, fact that the um, martyred saints uh, appeal to God and say, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you avenge? Our deaths, and so I think there is a sense of time there. That in some way, uh, they still remain, you know, it's without end. But there's continuity. There's a, an understanding that history is ongoing and things like that, and a sense that there needs to be final judgment brought to bear. And so, anyway, just and you would think that we would, we certainly should remember in heaven that we were redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, what Christ's death on the cross meant to us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Everyone talks about going to see their loved ones again, and, and but I, I think our eyes will be fixed on Jesus. Mm. Yeah, obviously Christ, I think, will be the center of everything. But uh, I, I think that there'll be great joy, I think, in the fellowship of the saints. I think that it's something that's still valuable. And, you know, we see Christ in each other in different, you know, in some respects.